are kicking off a brand new series called At the Movies. And whenever I kick off a series that involves movies, I always get the same question. Here's the same question that I always get whenever I kick off a series like this, and it goes something like this. Matt, why in church are you talking about movies and why are you showing movies? It's church. And you know what? That's not an unfair question, but I do think the question reveals a kind of disconnect when it comes to church on Sunday. Listen, if church on Sunday happens and it doesn't make a difference on the outside world in your life Monday through Saturday, then something is not going on right in the church on Sunday. Sunday isn't just about coming to get something for today and then not having it apply Monday through Saturday. We come today to hear from God so we can live for Him Monday through Saturday. And here's something that I discovered. Listen, you probably already know this. You, this probably isn't a surprise to you, but I kind of discovered something about movies that I want to share with you this morning. I'm going to put it up on the screen and it's this. It's that movies, that movies, that movies, Movies often reveal truths about life, people, and God. Listen, when you go and watch a movie, there's usually some part of a movie that reveals a truth about life, people, and God. But here's the cool thing about movies. This statement just isn't this part. Movies reveal truths about life, people, and God. But here's what it also does. But without the baggage attached to religion or faith. When you and I go to a movie... When you and I go to a movie that moves us, that tells a great story, you know, it can point us to a truth without the hindrance of kind of the ideas that we already have in our head. We can actually understand truth in a movie because it's not associated or tied maybe with religion or faith. And so we can begin to understand a truth about life, people, or God. Listen, listen, listen. I started watching movies when I was a young kid, and I can still remember specific scenes from certain movies because these specific scenes from certain movies held a truth that I knew to be true and that I wanted to be true in my own life. I mean, going back to one of the very first movies that I ever remember seeing. Now, this is going to date me, so I'm sorry that I'm old, right? But I remember as like a nine-year-old going with my biological dad to see the original Star Wars. And I still remember the scene where Princess Leia Remember, she was the pretty girl with the, the curly ear thingies, right? And I remember Princess Leia, she was talking to Han Solo, and she said, Han Solo, you just take reward. You do what you do best, which is taking care of yourself. And then Luke Skywalker was trying to destroy the Death Star, but Darth Vader was about to shoot him down. But then who comes from the side? His good buddy, Han Solo, and the whole theater cheered. And I remember learning in that moment that friendship and loyalty matters in life. I remember as I got older, I saw the movie, The Lord of the Rings, and I had read the books as a kid, but I'll never forget the scene in the very first movie where Gandalf stands on a bridge and there's this ugly monster. His friends can't do anything about it. And he stands in between them and he utters these words, you shall not pass. See, so, see I love the second service, man. Y'all are with me, y'all my people, right? And so I love when he says, you shall not pass. It, it says this to me, I said, sometimes there's nothing, if you're not willing to die, for anything, then maybe there's nothing really worth living for. And I love that passion. I remember the movie Braveheart. Do you remember that dates me too? Mel Gibson, as the troops were running away against the English army, and he turns to him and says, yes, if you run today, you'll live. And then he says these words, but would you trade all those days from now until then for just one chance, just one moment to tell your enemies they can take your life, but they cannot take your... Is anyone fired up? Give me a shield and a sword. Right? And it's just this moment where sometimes there are some things we're standing for. And then any of you see the movie Princess's Bride? Right? Princess's Bride, I love it when Buttercup pushes the pirate down, but she doesn't realize it's Wesley. And Wesley screams, as you wish. And then so she jumps and rolls down the hill with him. It's a story about how love can carry you and I through the storms of life. Who doesn't want that? I remember Armageddon with Bruce Willis about the meteor that was going to crash and kill the whole earth. And the bomb won't blow up remote, so Bruce Willis has got to stay behind. And he's talking to his daughter, and he says, listen, I can't be with you to walk on your wedding day. And then he utters these words, Gracie, we win. And he pushes the trigger, and he sees all the memories of his child. And it tells us a truth that sometimes in life, sacrifice is required. I remember saving Private Ryan, that scene where he's at all the crosses at North 
Norman and he falls to his knees and he begins to weep and he asks his family, did I live a good life? Tell me I lived a good life because there were men who died so that I could have the life that I had. Finding Nemo. (laughs) Finding Nemo. As they were going through life and they couldn't find little Nemo, Dory had a little phrase, just keep and it teaches us the truth that sometimes through life's and ups and downs, we just need to keep moving forward. Just keep swimming. The movie Hidden Figures, about a group of women who were underlooked during an era of racism and bigotry. I'll never forget the one scene where there was an African-American person in the, in the restroom and, and her supervisor was a Caucasian lady. And she turned to the other woman and she says, I really don't have anything against you all. And I love her response, which is filled with both grace and truth. And she goes, I know that you believe that. Which means sometimes you and I have to stand up to bigotry and racism. I love Captain America. He's my favorite Avenger. And Winter Soldier, his best friend, Bucky, as a little kid, is mind washed and they're fighting. And he looks Bucky in the eye and he says, I am with you to the end. There is something about a friendship that we live and desire for someone who will stick with us through thick and thin. And then finally, Avengers Endgame. And if you haven't seen it, shame on you. But I love it after Thor's failure. He calls for his hammer, right? And he puts out his hand and he's got his eyes closed, hoping that he's still worthy, that the hammer will come to him. And when the hammer lands in his hand, there's this gigantic boyish grin on his face that despite his failure, he's still worthy. It reveals the truth that in humanity, despite our failure, we desire grace to still be loved. You see, movies often reveal truths about life, people, and God, but without the baggage of religion, or faith. You see, I put a list up here of things that movies reveal often to us, and we're going to put it up here. Movies often reveal this truth, and if you don't believe this, you just watch the news, but the movies reveal the truth that there is good and there is evil in this world. We don't want to pretend, we want to pretend like just people are broken and people are broken and busted, but the truth is there is good and evil. Movies tell us that there's love and there's hate. And when you see a movie, you often go, love is what makes things right and hate is what makes things wrong. You see in movies that there's friendships that we desire. There's an adventure we want to go on, but we don't want to go alone. We want to go with people who are on our side. And that betrayal of a friend, betrayal of someone who thought was for us is one of the most harmful things. That generosity makes the world a better place. And what makes the world busted is greed. That sacrifice is sometimes necessary to make the world a better place. And that selfishness destroys the world. And that courage is required because you may be scared and you may have fear. But at some point, standing up and doing the right thing and not doing it is cowardice. Listen, I've seen tons of movies. And I've never been in a movie theater where evil, hate, betrayal, greed, and selfishness and cowardice. People went, woo! No one cheers when they see that. No one walks out of the movie and goes, oh, that's the villain I want to be. I want to be like them. You know what we cheer for? We cheer for this side. We cheer for the good, love, friendship, generosity, sacrifice. That's what we cheer for in movies. And that's what we wish we would be because movies often reveal a truth about life and people and God. And I bet if you were thinking about the movie or movies that you love, the movie moments that you remember, it's probably because it touched your soul and impacted your heart And there was something in it that you identified with that unknowingly you agreed with that truth about people, life, or God. So to answer the question, why do we talk about movies and show movie clips? Well, simply because of this. Here's what we've discovered. All truth, ta-da, all truth belongs to God no matter where you find it. And so today I want to do something a little bit different. Today I want to show you a movie clip from the movie Kung Fu Panda, the original one. The movie Kung Fu Panda is actually a cute animated movie about this clumsy panda who seemingly has nothing to offer the world, yet in the end, he saves the day. So if we could, we're going to turn down the lights and we're going to let the movie clip roll. 
There's no charge for awesomeness or attractiveness. I love that line. Anyway, we just watched a clip from the movie Kung Fu Panda. And it's the opening clip in the movie where we see the kind of the main character, Poe, having this dream that his life matters, that his life makes a difference, that somehow his life counts for something bigger. Unfortunately, it's just a dream. He wakes up to his normal, ordinary, boring life as he falls down the stairs to be a noodle maker. And you might be going, what truth about life, people, and God does this have for each of us? And here's what I believe. I believe it leads to this. Life makes us feel ordinary, but we dream of making an extraordinary difference. See, here's what I believe to be true about all of us, and not just us in this room, but people in general, everywhere in the world, all through the centuries, on every con in every culture, is that we dream of making a difference, but there's something about life that causes us not to have the life or, or the kind of the dream to have a destiny that we want. I mean, come on, do you remember when, when you were little, and for some of us, that was a long time ago, right? But do you remember when you were a kid? When you were a kid, you didn't dream of counting money, right? When you, when you were a kid, you didn't dream of doing laundry, right? When you were a kid, you didn't dream of paying bills, right? Or doing the dishes or doing the yard. No. When you were a kid, what did you dream of? When you were a kid, you dreamed of being part of the ballet or a band, something that created art and beauty that would change the world. Maybe for you, when you were a little kid, you dreamed of being a nurse or a doctor that helped people get better and brought health to the world. Maybe when you were a little kid, you dreamed of like being a firefighter or a rescue person as other people would run away you would run toward danger. Maybe you thought about being in the military and serving your country to bring freedom across the world. But when you were a little kid, you probably had a dream that your life would count. But then something happened. It's called adulthood. It's called reality. And if we are really honest, you know what happens as we become adults? Life is difficult. Life is real. And as life beats us up, something happens as we get older. The difficulties and the hardships and the reality of life begins to beat against our dreams to make a difference. And you know what we end up as adults? We end up as adults with cold hearts and hardened souls. And that the only people that make a difference in the world are the fictional characters we watch on the screen at the movies and on our tablets and on our TVs. Life makes us feel ordinary, but we often dream of creating an extraordinary difference. And it leaves you and I asking a tough question. How do you and I not let the grind of life give us cold hearts and dead souls? How do you and I not let the grind of life derail our dream of having a destiny, of actually making a difference in this world? This might be one of life's most important questions. And here's some good news today, is that you and I are not alone in asking this question. People have been asking this question since the beginning. God knew this question would be a problem for humanity. And it was such a problem that Jesus himself addresses this in a unique way that is probably shocking and catches most of us by surprise. He does something extraordinary. And we picked this up in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Luke, Luke 5, 1, and we're going to put it up on the screen. It says this, One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed on him to listen to the word of God. Now, I want you to kind of understand something. Jesus, God's son, shows up into the world, not kind of as a king, not as a ruler, not with kind of like a superhero cape where he's, he's solving all kinds of problems in the world and he's bringing world peace. No, Jesus shows up as a servant in a country that's been conquered by a foreign army, and he's speaking to a a group of people on a sandy beach and there's a lot of crowds of people there and he's probably going my voice is going to run out soon and so here's what happens next he noticed two empty boats at the water's edge for the fishermen had left them and they were washing their nets <clears throat> Stepping onto one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water. So he sat on the boat and taught the crowds from there. So here's what Jesus does. As the crowds were pressing against me, realizing something. Hey, there's some fishermen boats over there. If they put me out on the water, I can sit there and not be crushed. And then I can use the water to kind of use, to be an amplifier for my voice, the waves. I won't have a crackly voice. Everyone won't crush me and they'll get to hear the word of God if the fishermen let me. Well, the fishermen had been all, out all night, but because this was like a preacher dude and they wanted to do something good, they said, sure, you can borrow a boat. And so he spoke from there. We continue the encounter. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Now I want to stop right here because I think this doesn't include some things that probably happened like Peter's face and Peter's attitude. It's like 
Jesus was speaking to the crowds about God, right? And then he's like, Peter, why don't we put out and you catch some fish? And I bet this was Peter's thing. You're a preacher, I'm a fisherman. You see, Peter had been fishing since he was probably about 10 years old, right? His father had been a fisherman. His father's father had been a fisherman. They had been fishing on this lake forever. And he's like, hey, preacher dude, you stick to preaching. I'll stick to catching the fish. You stick to know what you're doing, right? And that's probably what he was thinking. But Peter's a gracious guy. So let's let's kind of catch up on his response. And he says, master, we worked hard all last night and did not catch a thing. I wonder how many of us go through life, the grind of life. We get education, we get a job, we get married, we have a family, we pay the bills, and we repeat and rinse, repeat and rinse. And I wonder how many mornings we wake up and feel like we didn't catch anything. We're stuck in the grind of life. But Peter says, but if you say so, I'll let the nets down again. And he's like, I'll humor you. We just cleaned the nets all morning. I mean, we've been getting all the seaweed out. We didn't catch anything. Now you want us to go put them back in the water. Now we have to clean them. But you know what? I'm going to humor you, preacher man. I'm going to go back out. And let's continue the encounter. At this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. And they shouted for help. And they brought their partners to the other boat. And as soon as both boats were filled with fish, and they were on the verge of sinking. So here's what happened. Jesus says, take your boats out. Put your nets back in on the other side. And you'll catch some fish. Peter says, ha, ha, ha. Watch this, preacher man. And he throws his his net over there and they start to catch so many fish that the net begins to break. And so they call their buddies with the second boat. Hey guys, we have so many fish. It's too many. Our nets are breaking. You need to come out. They put their nets in. Their nets begin to fill up. Both boats are so full of fish that they literally begin to sink. This is a miracle. I mean, Peter's a fisherman. He's been fishing on these waters for his life. And he understands that this, this is miraculous. And we continue with the encounter. When Simon realized what had happened, He knew this wasn't a coincidence. He knew this was a miracle. He fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, leave me. I'm a sinful man. He says, I understand you have something that I don't. You're connected to God in a way that I'm not. And I have some flaws and failures. And so you you really probably shouldn't hang around me because, you know, I've got some failures and I've got some flaws. I mean, I wasn't even picked to continue on in my Jewish education. I mean, at 10 years old, they kind of kicked me out of school and said, hey, you go catch some fish because that's as good as you're ever going to be. You just need to go do the grind of life. And I love Jesus' response. We pick it back up. Next slide. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught, as, the, as were the others with him, his partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were also amazed. Jesus replied, Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. They had caught the greatest catch of their lives. But they knew something, that when you catch a fish, it eventually dies and it rots and it stinks. They knew they'd have to go back out on the boat and just do it all over again. And despite their failures and despite their flaws, this one Jesus called them to come follow him and that their lives could count and their lives could make a difference. And in this moment, they had a choice. And I think they had the same choice that each and every single person in this room, lesbian watching online has. That at some point we have to trust God to take a step. And they stepped away from their boats and they stepped away from the fish to follow this one named Jesus. And they helped change the world. Unschooled, ordinary men who in the Jewish system of education weren't worthy enough to even follow a rabbi. And they changed the whole known world because they took a step. They made their lives count. So there are three observations I want to make this morning so that you and I, our lives can count. No matter how ordinary or how boring our lives is, our lives can count. And here's observation number one. God uses everyday people to change the world. Here's what I know about God. When you read the Bible, it often feels like these people have special ability. They're special people. We never be like them. But if you actually read all the text and you actually just take some time to kind of take off kind of the, the, the kind of the preconceived ideas you have, you begin to understand God just used everyday people. James and John and Peter, these fishermen, they weren't schooled guys. They were ordinary people who had gotten kicked out of the Jewish system. They were just everyday people. And here's what we discover. 
about everyday people. And this is going to be a little bit hard, and so I need you to kind of buckle up and go cha-ching, bing. This is going to be a little bit hard. Often, we want to have special ability. We also want to go, listen, I could change the world if I had some special ability that made me better. Matt, I can't talk like you. Hey, I can't sing like the people up on the screen. I can't write books like other people. I don't have any ability, so I'm just going to live an ordinary life. And here's what I discovered. God doesn't use ability. God uses availability. Y'all didn't hear me. God doesn't use ability, God uses availability. And see, the reason that God uses availability and not ability is because God already has all the ability needs. Say amen. Smile at your neighbor. God doesn't need your ability. You probably have the ability. You're talented and awesome. But God has enough ability. He doesn't need the ability. He needs your availability. And here's what I discovered why people would rather have special availability than be available. Because when you have a special, avail- a special ability, it's all about you. It's your ability. You get to choose how you want to use it, when you want to use it, and you get all the glory. But to change the world doesn't come from ability. It comes from availability. Availability is saying, listen, I am here not to use my ability, but to serve others. Jesus says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. I wonder if Christians stopped asking God for special abilities and started asking every day, God, how can I be available to be used by you? Because everyday people change the world. I want to give you an example of exactly what I mean by everyday people change the world. I have an acquaintance, a friend. Her name is Pam Harmon. You'll probably never read a book about her. You'll probably never see a movie made about her. There probably won't be a book written about her. And if you ever ran into her, she probably wouldn't talk about herself. She'd probably ask you questions about you. She'd say, how are you? What are you doing? What's going on in your life? And if you were wise enough to ask her, well, Pam, what do you do? She would probably answer, well, I create opportunities for kids and teens with disabilities to have the same opportunities that normal kids have, to have fun and hear that there's a God who made them and wants to be their friend. You see, I met Pam decades ago. And when I first met Pam, she was starting this thing, this thing called Club. It was in a Young Life organization, and it's called Young Life Capernaum. And Young Life Capernaum is where where leaders and Christians work with kids who have special needs. And Young Life's been around since the 40s. But all the clubs for Young Life were for regular kids who had no disabilities or had no needs. And so there was a group of kids who were getting left out, a group of kids who would come to school who had disabilities and wheelchairs, or had learning disabilities, or had emotional disabilities, who were being excluded. And because all people matter deeply to God, Pam said, that's not right. And we know Young Life wants to reach these people. And so she started one little club in this community. And the difference between a regular club and a Capernaum club is, and a regular club with high school, you can do it with two or three leaders for 60 to 80 to 100 kids. But when it's Capernaum or special needs kids, you need one volunteer per every kid that shows up because of the needs that they have. And the club started with a couple kids and just a couple leaders. And over the next several years, it grew into an amazing club. And it became a pilot club for other other communities around the area in the Washington, Maryland, and Virginia region to kind of copy this club to include kids with disabilities. And she went from just leading one club to leading a whole bunch of clubs and leading leaders of leaders. And eventually they said, would you be the regional person for these three states over that? And then a couple years after she had done an amazing job with those three states, she was given a bunch of more states, a division. And her current title is Vice President of Young Life Capernaum for Young Life. And even though you'll never read a book or see a movie, she's impacted tens of thousands of teens who have special needs because God uses, y'all aren't with me, God uses, God uses everyday people. Which leads me directly into observation number two, which is this. Power doesn't make our life count, but purpose does. We all keep waiting for God to strike us with some superpower. But here's what I discovered. Rarely does power create the change that we want in the world. It's usually the opposite. It's power that makes the world wrong. People who wrongly have power and wrongly abuse power is what makes the world busted and broken. If you want to change the world, it's not power, it's purpose. Jesus came and he washed the disciples' feet and he said, blessed are you if you do what I did. Go and do like I did. Jesus could have snapped his fingers. Jesus could have spoken the word and he could have conquered all the armies with all the power. 
But instead, Jesus fulfilled his purpose to be our sin penalty on the cross. And he redeemed us, not through his power, but because of his purpose. You and I don't need more power. We just need purpose. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. When I was growing up and going to school in elementary before I got incarcerated as a young man, I learned a little bit about history and kind of the civil war and kind of the civil rights movement and kind of how our country was busted and broken. I love my country. I don't know if you know this, but you can love your country and believe it's busted and broken. Y'all, y'all missed that. Let me say this one more time. You can love your country and know that it's busted and broken. Like we can, we can have both of those things. We don't have to let the media divide us, right? Can I get amen? Like we can love our country and realize it's busted and broken. So as I was growing up, I learned about a lady named Harriet Tubman. Have you ever learned about Harriet Tubman? Tubman? I mean, she was an amazing hero. Uh, she led the Underground Railroad, led over 300 slaves from the south into the north so that they could be free. And what she, what she do is she goes, she, she helped change the world. Not only did she lead the Underground Railroad, not only did she lead 300 slaves from slavery to freedom, did she know that she served in the Civil War? She was a scout for the Union in the Civil War. She was a cook in the Civil War. She was a nurse in the Civil War. And she actually led an assault to rescue some people. The first African-American woman to lead an assault in the Civil War. And when they tried to hold her pension, she fought it for 37 years and finally got her pension. And you might be going, Matt, what does that have to do with power versus purpose? Well, you have to understand, in the century that Harriet Tubman was born in, women were second-class citizens. Suffrage hadn't happened. Women weren't given rights. Women were thought of second-class citizens. So she was a woman, and she wasn't just a woman. She was a black woman in an era where theology was busted, where our country was wrong, and people with different skin color, different ethnicity were thought less than, and that is biblically wrong. And all people matter deeply to God. Our country got it wrong, right? And she was, she was a woman. She was black. And on top of that, she had been hit in the head by an object that had been thrown by a slave over when she was a child. And she had sickness. And she was, had fits where she would just be talking and then fall asleep. And she was sickly. She was a woman when it was a horrible century to be a woman. She was a black person in a country where there was extreme racism and, and, and prejudice and slavery. And she had a disability. She had zero power. But she had a purpose to love people. She had a purpose to go, all people are made in the image of God and have dignity. You don't need power to change the world. You just need purpose. I love what Mother Teresa says, and she's kind of quoting Jesus, but she says, there are no great deeds, only small deeds done in great love. You don't need power. You just need purpose. And I want to say our truth today. If your purpose is your life, you yourself, And I, when you die, you're like a fish. Everything that you did will rot with you. But if your story is part of a bigger story, then you can impact eternity and change the world. Which leads me into observation number three, which is this. We don't have to be the hero of the whole story, just our story. The problem is we want to be the hero of the whole story. And I need to let you know something. There's already a hero of the whole story. His name's Jesus. I just want you to know there's already a hero of the whole history, the whole story. It's God. You and I don't need to be the hero of the whole story. We just need to be a hero of our story. And here's where I find so many of us, myself included, get it wrong. We say, since I can't do everything, I'm going to do How wrong is that? Isn't that what's broken with the world? Is people look around the world, they look at the news, they look at all the bus and the brokers and they go, I can't do everything, so I'm just gonna do nothing. And having your life count isn't about doing everything, it's about doing something. Jesus didn't ask the disciples to do what his role was, he just asked them to come follow him and do what their role was. True story that I just read about actually today in today's Washington Post. I kind of have like a little cycle that I do. In the morning I get up and I read the newspaper, kind of catch up on where the life in the world is and then read my Bible, kind of put those two things in hand in hand. And today, as I was reading in the Washington Post, there was a story of a child who was autistic. Uh, It was a a kind of a young boy. He and his family went to Orlando uh, to do the rides and to have a great time. And they had to kind of plan their day um, because of his special needs and because of the amount of input that he'd be taking. He had this one ride, it was called 
the amazing Spider-Man ride, and that was the ride he wanted to go to. So they kind of organized their day through the park to end at this ride so that as they went along, it was always kind of like, hey, you have this coming on, it's great. So at the end of every ride, he would go to his parents, All right, is, the, is the amazing Spider-Man next? And they go, no, 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 we got, got a little bit more. And he would ask that at the end of every ride. And so finally, towards the end of the day, they got to the amazing Spider-Man ride in Orlando. As I'm reading the story, hey, and this boy had just been looking forward to it, he was so excited, so jazzed up. But something happened as the parents got in line, they noticed the line was actually beginning to leave. And the parents began to become worried. I mean, their son, who's autistic, had already been overloaded. And as they saw the people going away, they were going, what's going on? And as they got up to the front of the line, uh, the, the, the ride operator said, I am so sorry, ma'am. I'm so sorry uh, to the little kid. I'm so sorry, but uh, the, it's not working. There, there's, a, there's a defect and we don't put people on a defective roller coaster. It's malfunctioning. We need to get it fixed. Uh, the ride is closed. Um, and, and just like you have weaknesses and just like I have weaknesses, uh, this child's weakness was is that when they get overloaded, um, they kind of melt down. And so he kind of had this meltdown where he kind of got down on the ground and was kind of kicking and screaming and crying and just sobbing. And the ride operator was kind of a, a lady, I think she's in her mid-20s, and the lady operating it got down on the ground and just laid next to him and began to say, it's okay, I'd be disappointed too. You go ahead and cry. You go ahead and let it all out, you, it's okay. And when people would come by and stop, she'd say, there's nothing to see here, you can keep going on. She wouldn't let anyone take pictures. And she talked to the boy and she, she said, I get it. And she, she put herself on his level. She didn't even look him in the eye. She just said, I'm here with you. I get it. And after a few minutes, she goes, dude, would you want to sit up? And he goes, yeah. And, and as he sat up, she goes, well, would you want to get a drink of water? And so his parents gave him a drink of water. Yeah. And she goes, do you think you might be ready to get up? And she could get right up. And the parents were overwhelmed at the kindness of this woman who loved their son right where he was. She didn't save 30 people dying on a roller coaster. She wasn't the hero of the whole story. She was just the hero in her story. And I wonder how many of us would be the hero of our own story. You are meant to be the hero in your own story. If I had to sum up this message, it would go something like this. Movies reveal our dream to make a difference. Here's the truth. Every person is born with something in them that says, I want my life to count. But here's the good news, and God has a plan to make our lives count. Just like Jesus said to the disciples who had been looked over and who were leading ordinary lives where the grind of life was leading to nothing, the one Jesus comes along and says, come follow me, your life can count. And I want you to know if you're here today and you feel like your failures or your flaws discount you from your life counting, all you have to do is look at the people Jesus called and Jesus is making the same call to you. Come follow him because God has a plan for your life. Now I want to close with a very, very true story about someone who was deeply flawed and had tons of failures, probably more failures than the average person in this room. He was a 16-year-old boy who had just gotten out of juvie, who had been abused, who had been abandoned, and who was addicted. The 16-year-old kid showed up in a church like this that met in a school and the six-year-old kid heard about a God who loved people despite their failures, a God who died on the cross for them, and a God who didn't just die to get them to heaven, but they might begin to experience this thing called eternal life in the here and now. And the 16-year-old boy, I remember, sitting in the audience, began to dream, could God someday use him to make the world a different and better place? Well, after he'd been there a while, someone asked this 16-year-old boy, why don't you like help us set up chairs? Because this thing doesn't just happen by itself every Sunday. Would you, would you like to come and maybe set up chairs? Take a step. 16-year-old boy said yes and showed up early and set up chairs because they didn't have an auditorium like this. After a couple years of setting up chairs, someone asked this kid now 17, would you, would you think about ushering? And I'm like, well, what does it take? A breath mint and a smile. I so said, I can do that. 17-year-old kid was an usher. A couple years later, they asked, hey, we need people to teach, not the next generation, but the now generation. We need some men back working with the kids. Would you be interested in teaching a first grade class? This kid took a step and said yes. And then after teaching first grade, a couple years later, they said, hey, we have a college and career group. Would you, would you think about maybe teaching the college and career group? And this now young adult said yes. 
This young adult got married and someone said, would you volunteer for this organization called Young Life that works with high school and middle school students? Took another step and said yes. They asked this young married man who was pregnant with his first child, would you move to this place called St. Mary's? And I said, no. I love it here now. Someone asked this grown man with kids after a decade of doing Young Life, would you play in a church? Yes. You see, God's plan always starts with small steps. And I wonder how many of you are waiting for your life to count, but God has been calling you to take a step. What step is God calling you to take? Because here's a truth that you know and I know, but we never really say out loud. It's destiny. Having our lives count doesn't happen in one magical moment. Destiny isn't made in one moment. Destiny is made in small steps taken every day over a lifetime where you look back at your life and go, I can't believe what God has done. I'm here today not because of my ability, and I'm here despite my failures and flaws. Because every time someone said, would you? Is there a step that God might have for me to take? I said, yes. Because God uses ordinary, everyday people to change the world. And so I want to challenge and leave you with a question. What step is God calling you to take? And what will you say? Because fictional characters in the movies and in books and on TV don't change the world. Real people do. What step will you take? for your life to count. Let me pray. Hey God, you're amazing. Jesus, you showed up to fishermen who were ordinary unschooled people who had flaws and failures. And you said, come follow me. God, you're still saying that today. God, I pray that everyone that can hear the sound of my voice would know that you are asking them to come follow you. God, I pray that everyone here, despite their failures, despite their flaws, would know that you have a plan for their life to count, to impact eternity and to change the world. God, I pray that you would give every person here or on the sound of my voice, God, give them eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that would say yes to whatever small step it is that you're asking them to take. Even though life makes us feel ordinary, God, you call us to live a life that counts and that makes a difference. Not because we earned it, not because we deserved it, but because Jesus died on a cross so that we could have the life that you meant for us to have. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.